All right, folks, we are uh, in the podcast booth at NGConf, and I'm here with Alex Eagle. Hello. Now, Alex, you work for Google. Yeah. And uh, are you officially part of the Angular team? Or Yeah, I've been on the Angular team for a little over four years. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Yeah, I know we've had you on the show. I I just know that Bazel's kind of been a, a thing at Google for a long time, and I didn't know if you worked with them or if you worked with the Angular team. So, Actually, I did for a long time work on um, some Google internal tools that show build results, and I was also the tech lead for our continuous integration system. So I worked a lot adjacent to the Bazel team, and right. so I've been um, working with them in several capacities. In one, in one case, we actually added... Um, the build event protocol so that Bazel gives you um, a real-time stream of events of how the build is oh, progressing, okay. and we use that for, for various things uh, in, our, in our continuous build system and in the results UI. Cool. Well, um, I actually want to talk to you about the conference here for a minute, and then we'll go back to Bazel, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but, yeah, how many years have you been to NGConf? I guess this is my fourth. Fourth? I've lost count. And have you spoken at all of them, or...? So I had a workshop last year. I had a segment of the keynote, I think, the year before. This is actually the first full track talk I've had. So Nice. Yeah, I was staying up imagining so many faces pointed at me. <laughs> but now it's over. <laughs> yep. Just finished my talk. Yeah, take a deep breath. So relaxed right now. Yeah. Ah, let's they, have a drink. Yep, absolutely. Can you add a sound effect of a whiskey glass right here with some ice cubes in it? Yeah, maybe. Okay. I don't want to put you in too much work in post. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so what's your favorite part of NGConf? Um, my favorite part is what it seems like it looks like for attendees, uh -huh. which is always different from my experience because we're usually in some shipping some software and putting right. together talks and just, it's, it's always a scramble for us. But I love, i love seeing the whole community come together. I love the family yep. reunion feeling of it. I love, yep. you know, I get on the plane to, to SLC and I'm just already in the conference because there's somebody on my flight who's coming. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's just awesome. Cool. And are you based out of the Bay area? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, our team is in Sunnyvale. Okay. Cool. And uh, you've been over here talking to people over at the Basil booth, which is right next to the podcast booth. Yes, we've we've uh, we've been answering a lot of people's questions. Most of the questions are, "What is Basil?" Um, unfortunately, my talk being at the end of the third day, I had to answer that question a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Well, now people can go watch the talk because it'll be up on the internet. Yeah. Very soon. So, what is Basil? Okay, well, let me see if I've answered this enough times. So um, one way to think about it is that we used to use something like Gulp, which mm -hmm. was a build tool that didn't do anything all by itself. It was just there to orchestrate calling out to other right. tools. Yep. Um, Gulp was great for that model, but mm -hmm. it had a lot of other problems and really handle error cases very well. Right. Um, the configuration was clunky. So you can think of Bazel as being a, an improvement on Gulp okay. in that it just calls out to your existing tools. We write uh -huh. a plugin for each of the tools so that it, uh, Bazel knows how to call it. Um, but Bazel does a much better job of giving you the right affordances to configure it just by describing your inputs and not saying what to do. Um, and it gives us a lot of ability inside of the plugins to do really smart things. So one of the things I showed in my talk is we use the TypeScript type definitions as the means of one library depending on another. Right. So that if you don't change the DTS output of a library, we don't need to retype check anything above it. Right. So we can do a lot of clever things using Bazel plugins to optimize um, things like incrementality in the build. That makes sense. It seems like a lot of people have been using Webpack. The Angular CLI uses Webpack. So are you just doing these kinds of things better than Webpack, or are you doing it differently than Webpack? So obviously Webpack's a great tool, right. and um, I think a lot of people are going to continue to use it regardless of what we do. So yep. um, one part of the answer is Bazel just call, can just call Webpack. We already uh -huh. have a Webpack bundle plugin. Okay. Um, it's pretty basic right now, but I think we will expand that to help uh, some onboarding cases where you need to keep your Webpack config because you have a lot of load-bearing stuff in there. Right. 
Um, we're still evaluating. So right now, when you opt into Bazel, we use Rollup. Uh huh. Um, but we could we could have used Webpack. Right. Uh, we're still evaluating which one is the better default going forward. Um, and since the Angular CLI currently doesn't, uh, it hides Webpack from you. We still right. have the ability to change that. Yeah. So we're figuring that out. Um, we do have, there is a fundamental difference from what Webpack does, which is that all of the, the loaders and such that you configure in your Webpack config are all essentially at a global scope and can, and can access each other's stuff. And so uh -huh. there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of interactions between them. And so if you talked about taking a Webpack build and splitting it up among many processes or even sharding it out to, uh, machines on the cloud, which is what right. we do with Bazel, you run into the problem that that's a breaking change for mm -hmm. Webpack's model because the, right. the, the plugins were never isolated in that way. Right. And so um, one of the fundamental differences in Bazel is that the plugins really have a very strong isolation model from mm -hmm. each other. And so you have a better guarantee that you can compose them in a novel way and not have right. weird feature interactions between them. Yeah, I, I can kind of see it that, yeah, if you, if you want them to talk to each other and they can orchestrate things in a certain way, that might be an advantage. But at the same time, that's a lot of interaction that then you have to keep track of. And so it, it could also make it hard to debug if something goes wrong. So there's another difference related to debugging, which is that Bazel by default um, uses a lot more files on disk for its intermediate artifacts. Okay. Um, which has trade-offs. Obviously, it's faster to keep everything in memory like Webpack right. does. But it means that when the build fails, you can go see a generated config file. You can see the right. JavaScript output from uh -huh. your TypeScript compilation before it got fed into the bundler. Right. You can see the bundler output before it gets fed to the optimizer. Um, so a lot of the time when someone has issues with the Bazel build, we say, well, just look in the output folder and find some of these generated intermediate artifacts, and then right. you can at least bisect where the problem was. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, because if it's all in memory, then the OS will clean it up, and right, there's yeah. really not a good way to inspect it. Yeah, I think you just end up doing print line debugging inside of yeah. the tool, like at the spot where the, the data structure is going through memory. Dump me the file so I can tell yeah. what's happening. Yeah, it makes sense. So uh, I, I'm just a little bit curious, you know, as, as things progress... Um, where do you see Bazel ending up? I mean, is it just going to be a tool that mostly people use when they're using the Angular CLI and it's hidden from them the same way that Webpack is? Or do you see other communities maybe picking up Bazel and using it for React or Vue or jQuery we, or whatever? Yeah, we've already seen... Well, Bazel's a full-stack build system, so actually right. most of its adoption so far is for Java and C++. Oh, interesting. I yeah. didn't realize that. Uh, and that's, that's where the Bazel team really started their uh -huh. you know, effort several years ago when they open source it. Those were the original rules. They also have Android um, is one of the other um, top supported mm -hmm. in, uh, ecosystems. There are also rules for every other language under the sun and every runtime. Right. I mean, like, there's, there's .NET rules to do C Sharp and there's Scala and Rust. And, and, right. um, so I, th my take of where Bazel is headed is uh, it's hard for me to say because I've been working in it for so long. I lose uh -huh. some perspective. But I think either... We'll be successful enough at getting some adoption of it that it starts to take hold as the next version of Gulp, essentially. Right. So, like every few years, as a new build system in JavaScript land, we could yep. just be the next one. And I think if we manage to make it successful enough that Angular developers can rely on it, then other ecosystems will will want to take a look. Right. And I've been helping out. Um, I met somebody who works on Preact, mm -hmm. um, who was who was thinking about how to um, hook up some Bazel into their build. So, yeah, it, it should become. I think either it will become part of the ecosystem or. You know, it will, will it won't have succeeded because right. Um, it's it's there's still a lot for us to do to make it um, a drop in replacement for the the tooling today in the CLI. But that's what right. we're going to work on for the next six months or so. Um, and the place we want to get to is to have one tool chain mm -hmm. across both Google internal and Angular CLI and the cases where you need to you know customize your build. Uh, right. Where today you, we have quite a number of tool chains across those use cases. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess the other question I have then is, do you expect that people using the Angular CLI are actually going to notice a difference when it switches over? Or for the most part, is it just going to be a build? Our ideal is that if you have a small app where um, the build is already working fine for you, that you wouldn't notice it at all. Mm -hmm. We're not quite there yet. We need to do things like taking Bazel standard out and hiding that and just reporting right. the the lines that, you're, that the CLI currently reports. Um, Obviously, the, the most of the benefits for pitching in, in, in adding Bazel to our tool chain is both is the ability to do full stack. So if you're doing Angular right. Universal, you mm -hmm. have a pretty bad story today for development mode. We want to do a lot more things that, that have a server side footprint. Right. Um, and then obviously also really large scale apps. So if right. your app if your if your compilation is slow, um, we want to do a little bit more. I think to help diagnose what the slow step in the build is, mm -hmm. um, and confirm that Bazel um, solves that specific problem. Because like you know if your if your build is is 
has a, it depends on what shape your build is, how incremental it is, and right. and um, which tools are slow, and whether we're still running those same tools under Bazel. Bazel doesn't just magically make a tool run faster. That's true. It needs to be able to shard it into many processes mm -hmm. or avoid running it when something doesn't when one of the inputs hasn't changed. Right. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash A story. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Yeah, I think that's another thing that gets me excited it, to some degree about it is just that um, currently when I run a build, it seems like it pulls everything in and then puts everything back out, right? And it seems like Bazel set up so that to some degree at least, it, if something hasn't changed, it won't build that. It'll just build everything else that depends on the things that I did change. Right. One way I explain this for Angular developers um, is that sort of similar to change detection, we need to walk the which change uh -huh. detection walks the component graph and figures out what needs to be re-rendered. Right. Bazel walks the graph of the whole build um, dependencies and figures out which nodes are dirty and then only re-executes, right. re-evaluates those. Right. So it may repackage my JavaScript if that's where the changes are. Yeah, and you but, typically will have some some step at the root of the app, mm -hmm. which is like. Um, yeah, the, the the final published package, and basically any right. change you make will cause that to need to be rebuilt. Right. But only if your test depends on the published package. And so in a lot right. of cases, we write tests that only depend on a subset of the code. Right. And you don't have to build everything when you run that test. Oh, that makes sense. So it is it is mm -hmm. getting the performance out of it is somewhat a task of thinking about how to lay out your code such that the dependency graph um, doesn't have a lot of failure modes. Like the worst right. case would be a funnel where you have a bunch of libraries, they all go through one optimizer, and then all of your tests depend on the output of the optimizer. It means that any any change in any library mm -hmm. will make all of the tests dirty and need to be rerun. Right. So then you don't get the benefit if your build shape looks like that. That makes sense. Um, so uh, let, let's let's talk about you for a minute. So uh, when you're not Bazeling or Googling or you know JavaScripting, what do you spend your time doing? Uh, I have a couple of kids, mm -hmm. four and eight. Um, they want as much attention as they can possibly extract out of me. So they're actually here at the conference. They've been doing the NG Kids, which is amazing. Oh, cool. They, they really love it. So for they're anybody playing with my kids. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Maybe maybe we can compare notes later. Hopefully yeah. they've been getting along. Hope so. Um, so uh, Breath, Zelda Breath of the Wild has made an unfortunate entrance into my <laughs> life. I knew that I should never get a Nintendo Switch and I should never get the game, but... I have mine right here, actually. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we should uh, entertain everyone while they listen to us play. <laughs> um also currently an avid Sharks fan, uh, so I included a Sharks reference in my talk. Mm -hmm. um, in my rehearsals, I said go Sharks, but then on stage I chickened out. So Sharks are... San Jose hockey team. Hockey, I was yeah. going to say. Um, yeah, I'm more of a soccer fan myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, they're basically the same, except you have much duller skates and uh, you don't get a stick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yep, and when, when you run somebody into the boards in <laughs> soccer, that's bad. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's perfectly legal in hockey. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so how long have you been at Google? Ten years. Ten years? Yeah. That's like forever. Ten and a half almost. Yeah, it, it does. Uh, when I got to ten, I was sort of surprised that I'm still there. And uh, you've been working on this kind of thing? Yeah, somehow I've always found myself interested in sort of the periphery of compilers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I've worked a little bit in the Angular compiler. I also had a a cool project to extend the errors that you get out of the Java compiler, which I've done right. again for TypeScript, which is called error prone. Um, and the one for TypeScript is called Tsetse, like the Tsetse mm -hmm. fly. Mm -hmm. It starts with TS, so it's TypeScript branding. Right. So I'm really interested in things like static analysis, basically things about um, how can we write software to make it easier for you to shake all the bugs out of your software. Right. So that goes all the way through CI, um, and and you know the whole tool chain is kind of related there. Right. So then um, I guess my other question is, 
um, how did you settle on solving these problems for Angular as opposed to other ecosystems or tooling or whatever languages at Google? So I just got lucky. I my, my first day at Google, I was put in an office with Brad Green, uh -huh. and uh, my second day, I met Mishko, who gave me a crazy starter project that happened to be right in the middle of Bazel. We we wanted to generate um, source jar files, which Bazel didn't know how to do at the time, so that we could do some sort of static analysis over the sources. Right. Um, and uh, so, I, so I worked with Mishko actually for my first year or two at Google, and then I went to work on continuous build and um, related things. And then when at script happened and they was, there was time to work on compilers yep. in, in the Angular team, that sounded great. So, uh, so I got to come back. Nice. And so I guess the other question I have is, is that um, it seems like, um, you know, you mentioned Bazel was built for C, what, C Sharp or C++ and Java? C++ and Java are uh, maybe were maybe the first languages that it targeted right. in the like in rolling out to the external ecosystem. Internally at Google, we mm -hmm. use it to build almost everything. Right, but uh, I guess my question is is I've talked to people who work on uh, sort of ecosystem level tools and things like that, and you know it we're talking JavaScript, but they're actually working in C++ or C or whatever. So you know what is Bazel written in? Is it written in one of these languages, and is that where you spend most of your time? Or are you usually doing JavaScript or I, some combo? I, of the I write two? so Bazel has an extension language, which is basically a flavor of Python, although uh -huh. it doesn't use a Python interpreter because you don't really want to have random metaprogramming happening in your build right. configurations. We really want it to be much more static, statically expressed, um, and declarative. Uh, so I, I write mostly TypeScript and Starlark code, which is the mm -hmm. name of this Python variant. Um, from my perspective, I, I file bugs in the Bazel team, and they're very responsive. Right. Supporting the Angular ecosystem is a really big priority for them. Um, to answer your question, it so happens Bazel is written in a language that requires a VM, mm -hmm. which is Java. But as soon as I say that, it sounds like you're going to have to install Java on your machine, which is not true. Bazel team did a really smart thing, which is they statically link a minified version of the Java runtime that they actually depend on. And a lot of uh -huh. the size, sa size savings they've had lately is by stripping out parts of that JRE. So you just you just download a binary. It doesn't right. matter that it, whether it has an embedded VM or not. Interesting. Okay, so it sounds like it's primarily written in Java with some of this other stuff sprinkled in. Yeah, the extension language that goes on top. Good deal. So yeah, so if if I decide that I want to write an extension for Bazel, can I? And do I have to use Starlark? Yes and yes. Um, I would like to find some time soon to do something like a Twitch stream and actually just live code mm -hmm. um, a Bazel extension um, in the in the in the sort of on the small end of the spectrum. It's really only a few lines of code. You just tell Bazel if you, if somebody describes that their inputs is a foo, mm -hmm. then run this tool with these inputs to produce these outputs, and that's enough to have right. Bazel stitch it into the you know the the the, the full um, dependency graph. Uh, and in some other cases, you, there are some things where uh, it requires rehosting some stuff, like mm -hmm. locating where your inputs are can depend on where Bazel places them. So um, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of interesting stuff there. But at this point, we've written a number of, of, uh, of these plugins, and I think we're getting pretty good at explaining it. And um, so I think we, we, we should just uh, have a boot camp or something teach people how to do it. Certainly, if, if, if Bazel becomes successful in the Angular ecosystem, there will be a lot of extension authors out there. Yep. Makes sense. So where do you hope things end up? It sounds like you're hoping that it gets at least traction in the Angular community, but are you hoping that it expands to other communities and other ecosystems? Yeah, I think um, I think it's it's almost a pity if you're in a large organization to adopt Bazel and then only use it for your front end because the full stack story is really a big part yeah. of the value proposition. So I do hope that it, it becomes um, successful at least within a bunch of large enterprises. Um, and I guess my other hope is just that we get to a point where it's self-sustaining. And if I go take a break for a while, Basil will carry on. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think we're getting close to that inflection point. Hopefully we've got um, some an adoption coming out of ng-conf this year. Uh, and we're going to follow up with all of those enterprises to help make sure they, they are successful. Right. What, what was it that prompted Google to make it open source? That's interesting. There was a... There was a guy who tried to open source it quite a while ago, and there wasn't very much enthusiasm for doing it because, of course, open sourcing it introduces a very big tax on the team to support both ecosystems. Right. Um, I think the story is something like um, Googlers who left and went to Facebook and Twitter started clones of Bazel because uh -huh. they understood that the model is the right model, and right. they even reused exactly the same configuration language. Um, 
And so I think it was mostly us trying to catch up with the, the ecosystem and I gotcha. um, and not end up with uh, with a lot of fragmentation. You know, and Google has had plenty of examples of that happening, like MapReduce turned mm -hmm. into Hadoop and Bigtable turned into... Right. Uh, uh, you can edit this part out because <laughs> my brain is tired from talking to people all day and doing my talk. Right. Very nice. Um, you don't have to edit that part out. I'm, I'm happy to take ownership of my... No speaking, my no, flaws. I want, I want to normalize this for everybody. I don't want listeners to think that they're supposed to sound smart all the time because <laughs> I don't. It was funny. I was talking to the guys from Stack Blitz, and like five minutes before the talk, things weren't working. And so, yeah, we we had a little bit of a conversation about, yeah, so we get up on stage and everything looks like it, it runs smoothly and is all polished. And I'm like, you know, the reality is, is sometimes <laughs> stuff's broken right before. And yeah. You know, yeah, it's a little bit stressful. Yep. Cool. So, uh, what what's coming up for you after the conference? You're just gonna fly back to the Bay Area. I'm gonna I'm gonna fly go back, back and I'm gonna disappear in the woods for a night and uh, recover my sanity. And then we're we're fixing bugs for Angular 8. We're we just shipped release candidate too, but we've been you know busy with conference stuff. Right. So uh, we definitely have some issues to pick up there. Differential loading is our most exciting feature. Yep. Um, but since we enable ES 2015 in your compilations, that has some knock on effects that we need to go deal with. We want to make sure that that feature sticks and we can keep it on by default for everybody. Um, cool. so yep, just burning down the issue queue and get a good version eight release out. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks Alex. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.